January, interesting month for me, given that I kind of got sort of back in a reading groove. And how much of a reading groove I got into is helped by the fact that I kind of read a couple of chonkers. <laughs> now, I'm going to start with, book number one, is a book that I actually finished in January the 1st. So most of an end of December kind of, kind of read. But it is the self-published novel that is out now, but wasn't at the time, The Eleventh Cycle by Cian and Arlen. Now, Eleven Cycle, I think, is a bit of a tough book to talk about because, on one hand, I utterly loved it. I thought the fantasy story that he built, the kind of mythos that goes around the world, everything that goes along, is really tightly and nicely done. It's sort of dark, so themed, according to Cain. I don't know if I would have thought that if it wasn't for that prompt, but I can sort of see it in the background. Given that there's a dark, brooding nature to the world and a kind of overhang from from the gods and the, the, like I say the mythos that comes away from that so while you have this really incredible world building multicultural races multicultural problems and a world that's kind of on the brink of teetering into disaster all in the while accompanied by movements and and things that are going to happen in terms of the gods you also have a book that's kind of very rough Cain is cruel to his characters. There are a lot of really horrible and nasty things that either beset them at the start or beset them through the story or happen to them by the end of the book. And if I'm honest, I'm kind of unsure whether I sit on whether it's justified or not. It is shocking. It is hard to get through in some parts, but they're only very small minor parts of a book that I, like I say, I otherwise loved from start to finish because i think if nothing else this is a book that really needs to discussed i think it's a book that's going to be wildly successful because i think it is a very 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 good fantasy story and a great world and some of the bits that happen and the cruelness of the characters and some of the horrific scenes i would say read the foreword make your way through it make your own decisions if you're predisposed if you're not likely to be shocked then just carry on regardless although i still would be surprised if you weren't shocked at some stage throughout this it didn't at least make you wince as it did me but a fantastic start to my years reading in the 11th cycle and one that i thoroughly enjoyed and one that i'm i would like to do a full review of but like i say it's a tough book to review because there's so much going on next book up that i read well we stepped into the back into the world of the expanse we're in book six at the moment babylon's ashes james s a corey and it strikes me that i'm kind of a good lot of the way through this book now this book leads to a bit of a departure for me in terms of the series as this is kind of where the handover for the end of the tv series comes before we step into what is a bit more unknown territory in book seven which will be Persepolis rising now i'm doing this as part of a read along with robin and layla and steve on steve talks books channels and it's honestly one of the highlights of of the entire month for me when i get to spend some time with those lovely people especially because we don't all see things exactly the same way and for me there's the real spice and joy in discussing what we read but for a breakdown of what babylon's ashes is it continues the story of the belt taking back control or taking back some measure of control through the free navy and how much of a threat that causes to the rest of the, the world and the stability of it. And at the centre of that is our main crew in the Ross and Auntie, led by James Holden, Naomi, Amos and Alex. With a few other associated characters. Things that I'll say about The Expanse. I mean, I'm surprised The Expanse is as popular as it is because I don't think it's everybody's point of view. But it is kind of sci-fi light and it really relies on strong character interplay with each other some of the scenes between the characters and the joy that you get between them i laugh out loud i cringe at others i get really angry in other places and this babylon's ashes i think is one of the very best books in the series and around this i think the two-handed feels like nemesis gates and this are like a two-handed bit where they're almost like part a and part b of the same overarching narrative but ultimately we get a very very good payoff here and uh, like i say the character work that's in here i think really starts to pay off in a way that that it's been building up to this point and i think one of the things that i hear a lot about daniel abraham's writing is that he has these long payoffs that he builds up uh, over the course of a number of books and really sticks it to you and gives you an emotional gut punch and i think there are real emotional pathos payoffs in here and just a terrific terrific read Next up for me was a reread of sorts, which is game one of A Song of Ice and Fire, which is Game of Thrones from George R. R. Martin. I had read this 
years ago before the TV series. I think I was reading it just as the TV series was announced. So whenever that was, I was reading this book. And I decided to get to the end of the book and then stop and wait for the TV series, which is subsequently what I did. So it was a bit of an interesting case insofar as having watched all of the series, being a massive fan of the series, but also having read this. And what strikes me about it is that the mind is a very unreliable bedfellow. What I thought had happened in great detail in the book that I was disappointed didn't happen in the TV show wasn't ever really in great detail. It certainly was expanded upon and given a bit more clarity because you get to see and think inside the minds of the characters rather than verbalised out. But actually, that didn't really happen. And often some of my perceptions of the of the characters or the, the heroes of the story are differ from TV show to book. So things like Tyrion. Tyrion is shown to be, I think, an awful lot smarter at the start of in this book than he is in the TV series, certainly at the start. And so you get a really nice insight into who they are as people under land, kind of the things that, that outwardly show like a size or his loudishness behaviour, the things that other people see. You get to see an insight into that internal minded character. Now what I will say is that it's kind of tough to talk about this in terms of whether I enjoyed it or not because I already know what happened in it. I'm not much of a rereader and Given that I knew the twists, etc. that was going to happen, there was nothing really surprising within here, apart from, again, more character details of things that I knew would pay off in the future, certainly between Varys and Littlefinger and all of that kind of Sir Peter Baelish, um, that I knew were going to come off later. There wasn't an awful lot new for me here, but I get to immerse myself deeper in the world and get to realise actually some of the more intricate interworkings of the houses, especially of the houses in the north, about who the players are within each of those areas, Relate that to the people that are on the, the wall, the impending doom and the rise of Daenerys, etc. It's all really terrific stuff and I'll be continuing on with this as well. Again, this is part of, we had another discussion about book one of this on Steve Talks Books channel. Getting a bit of a theme here, but something that really has encouraged my reading over the past month or so. And something that I've really got a lot out. And it's a terrific, terrific discussion about book one of the series. And I'm looking forward to continuing on with Clash of Kings book two. Right. So another book down the line and another different genre for me and this is historical fiction and the one that I managed to finish with Matthew Harfie's The Serpent Sword which is book one of the Bernicia Chronicles. Uh, it tells the story of Beobrand who tries to follow in the footsteps of his older brother. He finds out that he is dead but maybe not from the means that he has been told. This tells the story of the genesis of Beobrand as, as a person into a world that he is really not that familiar with and as he forges his way through the own land again the start of another series what is wrong with me i'm reading starting more series but as you can see i'm making decent progress at others we're doing okay there but something that is a nice break very easy read this book well written nice descriptive text nice to get a kind of realistic world to dive into without having to worry about the impact of magic or dragons come to save the day. There are very real consequences for this people, but it's equally bloody and kind of grim in much the same way as, as a grim dark novel is, except grim dark kind of is a representation of medieval England in a lot of cases. And here we have it. Bebran being an interesting character, the people that it comes along and he makes relationships with along the, lay, along the way are people that we really gravitate towards and like spending our time in. And so I think we'll get an on-running series here that, uh, navigates around this central character's life but the people will flit in and out of that we will hope for root for as the book progresses one that i'm very much enjoying and one that i have to say that i flew through easy read easy recommend and the last book i'm going to talk about well kind of blew my socks off the book that i'm talking about is a sci-fi book one of my plans for this year was to read more sci-fi this year and it was do android's dream of electric sheep and if you're familiar with that or you think that rings a bell this is the book on which Blade Runner the movie was set on now I think it's fair to say from the very outset that Blade Runner the movie is very much its own thing that uses the plot of this book to tell a story in that world but what I would say is the one thing that this book and certainly most Philip K Dick things that I have read is that they're not very plot centric you know the, there is a plot that happens there is a plot that that goes along and that you follow in terms of characters and relationships between the characters but all of that is secondary to the ideas that are in his books. Philip K. Dick does ideas 
better than anybody I've ever read, to be perfectly honest. And while some people might not like the plot, this direction of this, given that, you know, not massively great things happen in the book, the ideas in every page, in every chapter, really need digested. They really need taken apart. And this book absolutely blew my socks off with some of the ideas that are in there. Again, I'm thinking, how do I talk about this without really spoiling it? But I also think I can't really spoil it either because the themes of how in a future society we would deal with emotions when we don't have to deal with emotions correctly or the impact of religion, the impact of faith, how faith will actually change by technology. And when we have technological advances and can use faith and using it to control emotions and futures and all of that kind of stuff, why would we live in the existence that we are right now? Maybe it's my change of life. Maybe it's the fact that this is, maybe Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep is my midlife crisis insofar as philosophical meanderings and thoughts about who we are as people and actually the direction of humankind. Couple that with the fact that we have a book written you know, so long ago that feels so prescient and feels so natural to today's life and you're kind of, well, I was left wowed. Prose can be what prose are. Ideas are ideas. And actually that somebody would be cute enough or intelligent enough to say, look, I'm going to give you an idea. I'm going to let it ruminate there, but I'm going to respect you, the reader, to actually know what the impact of that would be. If we make this small and small change to the world, what actually does that mean for their going forward? And especially in a world where we have humans hunting down AI, threatened by the existence of AI, but it real as would be unsurprising for that kind of narrative, you know, what is the difference between humanity and really advanced AI in terms of sentient life? Loads of great ideas, absolutely blew my socks off, and I have to say, one of the greatest books I have ever read, although I know from speaking to other people that it left them cold. If you like science fiction and you like the idea of short science fiction, which this is, it's only about 180 pages, then you'll know that it can't get too long. I wouldn't want to read 500 pages of this, but this was about the right length. And in fact, some of the plot things I could have done away with and left it just with the ideas. Some people leave that cold, like I say. For me, I absolutely relished it. And that was my reading month. Have you read any of these? If you have, let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you've got any other suggestions that sit around this, then let me know in the comments as well. Thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you again soon. Take care.